Uh, it's not on the agenda. If everybody will have a seat, please, we need to start the meeting. And I call this meeting to order. If you'll please rise, and we'll have the invocation by Supervisor Watson, and then if Supervisor Moss will lead us in the, in the uh, pledge. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you continue to keep our nation under your care and provide a clear vision of our will to our leaders. We also pray for the speedy recovery of Supervisor Joy Brotherton. Please guide us as we consider the merits of each item that is placed before us. We pray for peace within ourselves and throughout the world. Amen. Amen. Please show me the pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Peggy, do we have Supervisor um, Johnson on the phone? Supervisor Johnson, are you online? Yes. Okay. Boy, does he sound enthusiastic this morning. <laughs> okay, uh, I need a motion to call for an executive session to be held on May 5th, 2014 at 9 a.m. for discussion and consultation with legal counsel in accordance with ARS 38-431.03. So moved. Second the motion. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Do we have any committee and or legislative reports this morning? Supervisor Watson? I have none this oh. morning. Okay. Supervisor Moss? I have none. Supervisor Johnson? Yes, Madam Chair, I do. Uh, the National Association of Counties held their second annual cyber symposium that focused on how counties should prepare to combat cyber threats and what resources are available to assist them. During the symposium, two tabletop exercises were performed that simulated real-life cyber attacks regarding data breaches and infrastructure attacks. During the simulations, participants were asked to imagine a scenario in which a cyber criminal had hacked into a county's network of data and held it for ransom, which hit real close to home for us. In order to help counties prepare for such attacks, there needs to be a plan of action put into place. Ralph Johnson, the Chief Information, Security, and Privacy Office for King County, Washington, noted that a number one reason for cyber breaches is usually due to negligence. He recommended that implementing cyber training for employees would help to reduce this, and that by putting into place an emergency response plan regarding cyber attacks, a county will be prepared when this happens. The second tabletop exercise dealt with public utility companies being attacked, resulting in not only electricity going out for county residents, but also cutting off access to the water supply. When one thinks of public utilities, they normally don't associate cyber attacks with them. However, they are not exempt from these types of attacks. With everything, everything connected to the internet today, one could easily hack into our utility companies and turn off power for millions of Americans. During the symposium, uh, many other elected officials from around the country stated that Justifying the amount of money needed to be spent on cybersecurity and training was very difficult. When it comes to funding for cybersecurity, you cannot base it on what is going to occur, but on what might occur. Andrew Dolan, who's the Director of Government Affairs for the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center, mentioned that there are over 3 billion Internet users in the United States. Dolan commented that it wasn't about how to prevent an attack as much as how to deal with it it's almost inevitable that you will become a victim of cyber attack at some point during your life. That's all, Madam. Thank you very much. Anyone else? All right, moving on. I need a, uh, well, do we have a county administrator's report? Madam Chairman, I, ha I don't have a report today. Thank you. Very good. Motion to approve the minutes of the February 13th, 2014 Board of Supervisors meeting. So moved. Second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, I'm going to open the call to public. <clears throat> Those wishing to address the board at the call to public regarding matters not on the board agenda must fill out and submit to the clerk a call to the public. Request to speak form located in the back of the room prior to the meeting. Action taken as a result of public comments will be limited to responding to criticism, referral to staff, or placing a matter on a future agenda. Comments are restricted to items not on the regular agenda, with the exception of the consent agenda, and must relate to matters within the jurisdiction of this board. 
Uh, and no one has signed up, but there's quite a crowd. So is there anybody who would like to speak at the call to public? Seeing none, I will close the call to public. Next up, we have uh, several presentations. And on your agenda, if you'll notice, um, there's a presentation of 2013 Service Awards. And I'd like to move that with no objection to be the first presentation, because there's a lot of people here who I know uh, are itching to get that done and maybe get back to work. So if everything's OK, I'd like to do that. So I call Ken Cunningham up. Madam Chairman, uh, Mojave County officially recognizes employees' years of service through the Service Award Program. The following service awards are for the year ending December 31st, 2013. Uh, this year we had 123 service awards for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 35 years of service. Um, this morning we'll present those service awards to those employees with 15, 20, 25, and 35 years of continuous service to Mojave County. The Board of Supervisors and Mojave County Management would like to congratulate all of our dedicated employees receiving an award. For those employees that were able to attend the presentation, please wait until your name is called and then come forward to receive your award. And then if you'd please exit towards the rock wall and um, shake hands with the Board of Supervisors, please. And then if you would wait, we'll have a group picture at the end of the presentation. For 15 years of service, Colin Patilio. Patilio. Shannon Summers. Congratulations. Nathan McDaniels. Nathan. Carmen Acosta. Congratulations, Carmen. Shailene Reed. Cynthia Tank. Sean Blackburn. Brian Bridges. Melinda Kemp. Janice Gardam. For 20 years of service, Ken Filder. Ron Nicholson. <laughs> Doris Yellowhair. Christine Ballard.
Lisa Hatchell. Warren Twitchell. For 25 years of service, Melody Jensen. Congratulations. Sonia Hamillo. Robert Ballard. For 35 years of service, Dorothy Hatton. There's one more award we'd like to announce. Um, this gentleman just completed 20 years of service and then he passed away this year. I'd like to mention Ron Weaver, special recognition for his 20 years of service. Um, I've been asked on behalf of his uh, widow. Um, for those of you who didn't know him, Ron Weaver worked for this county for 20 years uh, in parks and he loved his job and he did a great job and he was always honored and I, I only met him a few times. Unfortunately, he passed away on December 5th, 2013 and his wife Mary asked me to accept his award and I do so with honor. So thank you very much. Bring your crew over here. Well, they'll be here. Kind of, kind of keep shifting. Hilda, you stay where you are. <clears throat> These three over here, please come over there. A little bit. There you go. And I see a move? big hole in the center. There you go. I don't want to be sitting Come on. 35 years, you better be. Everybody smile. Keep your eyes open. Okay, um, while people are scuttling around, uh, I know I see we have um, 
the presentation by, it's a status update by John Flynn. He's the administrator of the Lake Mojave Ranchos Fire District, and I believe they're setting up right now. Morning, Chair, members of the board. John Flynn, uh, administrator for the Lake Mojave Ranchos Fire District, uh, requested to come and make a presentation this morning in regards to the status of, of the district. And with me is uh, Chief Pat Moore, who I'm sure you all know, and happy to appear here again this morning before the Board of Supervisors. And so this morning, I'm just going to give you a little background of where we were, where we are now, and kind of where we're, where we're going to be here in the in the future. So just as a background, uh, started February 6, 2013, appointed by the Mojave County Board of Supervisors to manage the, the district. We're 439 days into this project to date. The, um, the Lake Mojave Ranchos Fire District was financially insolvent and uh, we implemented a plan to mitigate the financial insolvency pursuant to uh, ARS 11-251-59. The financial workout plan was um, implemented in conjunction with uh, the treasurer's office, the Mojave County Finance Office and uh, staff. And so just as, a, just as a little background, on February 6, 2013, we had our uh, employees there 30 days without pay and benefits. We had uh, payables due of 146,000, included the back pay. We had a revolving line of credit balance of $437,000 owed to Wells Fargo. And we had some other long-term obligations at the district of approximately 97,657. Um, we immediately implemented a uh, recovery plan. Uh, since we started in February, we only had a few months uh, left in um, that fiscal year, but we reduced staffing, we eliminated a, a number of uh, full-time employment positions. And fortunately, uh, the delivery of fire and emergency medical services is very labor intensive, and so that's where a majority of the money goes. And so we were forced to eliminate some positions. All non-essential expenditures were curtailed. We, uh, we sold uh, a number of assets that the district had in that process. Um, some surplus fire equipment, surplus ambulances. We um, sold um, some vehicles that we had on lease purchase, which was part of that long-term debt so that we could get some finances back to the district and continue to deliver services. Um, service delivery outside of the jurisdictional boundaries was curtailed. I don't know if you're familiar with the district, but the district is eh, 60, 70 square miles, but the CON, the Certificate of Necessity for the Ambulance Service is 1,000 square miles. And so we still operate the ambulance out in those areas when we need to, but any um, fire services that we do are uh, um, struck typically uh, just in the district. Um, so at the end of the fiscal year, uh, we ended the fiscal year about 158,000 expenditures exceeding revenues. A lot of that was in the beginning of the fiscal year before, before we got in to implement the plan. We did pay almost half of the revolving line of credit balance down by the end of the fiscal year. And um, part of the plan was that the county would support the operations of the district as necessary. And so you could see we had a loan balance owed back to Mojave County at 276,000. Our current financial status right now, um, the uh, revolving line of credit balance, which was at 437,000, is, uh, is completely retired. Uh, our lease purchase obligations are completely eliminated. We've sold off all the uh, equipment that was involved with those leases, and actually we had surplus. We got more than we owed for that, and so we brought some money back into the district, and that's helped us reduce our debt. Um, all outstanding payroll and vendor obligations have been met, uh, which was 146000 as of February 6th. And you can see that our loan balance, which was fairly high, in fact, it had been up to 356000 if I'm not mistaken. I'm, I, I'm just trying to do that, hip shot that, is now down to $146,000 as of last Friday. We do anticipate that that loan balance that we owe to Mojave County will be down in the 
low double digit to single digit figure by the time we end up June 30th. In fact, I think the lot when we projected it on Friday, we were looking at about nine to twelve thousand dollars, depending upon how taxes go. So that that would be all that we would owe. Starting July 1, though, we'll either need to continue to register warrants, which will bring that loan balance back up, and or we'll need to be back on the revolving line of credit with, with Wells Fargo, and we can talk about how we want to do that. We're happy to continue to register warrants with the county if that's acceptable to you. I know that in speaking with the county treasurer, um, when we register warrants for a loan balance that the county makes more money than they get on their invest, uh, investing the money otherwise, and so we're happy to do that as well. <clears throat> Here's a, just a graph of the loan balance projections. We project that um, probably a majority of all the funds going into 2000, fiscal 2015 will be paid uh, in the first half of taxes because we'll pick up July, August, and September, just like all taxing jurisdictions do. Or we'll have to, um, we, we won't have money coming in and we'll have to expend the funds, so it'll either be on our loan balance of registered warrants or revolving line of credit, but by the time first half taxes come in, we'll be, we'll be completely back, back, on the, back in the black. Uh, so fiscal 14 budgets at 1.2 million, that's our current budget, 741,000 in property tax levy. We did a tax rate override this fiscal year. Um, the legislature passed some session law that allowed for special taxing districts, fire districts specifically, to override their tax rate based upon the recession. We took advantage of that in the last fiscal year to try and help reduce our, um, or eliminate the financial insolvency. We're still anticipating 126,000 in uh, tax delinquencies um, this fiscal year. We allocated 477,000 to debt reduction, and so you can see the, the outcome of that uh, before when I told you that we had eliminated almost all the debt and we were down to only owing the county about 146000 Our operating costs, 63000 a month, give or take. Some months are much lower, some months are higher, depending upon what expenditures we have. Um, some are lump sum, like insurance, tends to spike that. Here's the budgetary comparison. You can see that FY13-14 revenue, basically remains about the same on that top. That non-tax revenue is our ambulance revenue. And so in 13, it was overstated. And so we've reduced that down to what we think is a sustainable amount. And then in on 13 and 14 in the expenditures, you can see that in 13, there's a significant <coughs> amount of expenditures was for personnel and we've eliminated that and moved a lot of that expenditure to debt service. And that was the outcome that you saw that I spoke about earlier. Please. Um, I'm just going to drone on here, so ask questions as, as we go if you, if you have any. Um, fiscal year 2015, coming into July 1, we're proposing a $1.1 $1 .1 million budget. We'll have 675,000 in <coughs> tax levy revenue. We're back to the three and a quarter tax rate cap, projecting 108,000 in tax delinquencies. Total expenses at 743,000. We've allocated 115,618 to pay down the Mojave County loan. While the balance right now is 146,000, some of that will go away, and that's what we believe that we'll, we'll owe going into that next fiscal year, either to the county on registered warrants or to Wells Fargo on our revolving line of credit. 104,808 allocated to financial reserves in that fiscal year, and hopefully we'll, we'll see some financial reserves built up. Two-year projections, projecting tax revenues is flat, 675,253. Non-tax revenues is um, almost exclusively our ambulance services that we operate um, in Dolan Springs and Meadview and then out on, out on Highway 93. Uh, total revenue, 1.1 million. Operational expenses are 905 and then contingency capital allocations, 212. Some of that here in FY15 is the elimination of what was left of of the debt, and um, we'll talk about a little bit about operations and service delivery. I'll turn it over to, to Chief Moore, who takes care of that for us. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, our current operation is still um, unchanged. We're, our goal is to run three firefighters per day in that community of Dolan Springs and Meadview. Uh, as we've moved forward, we've transitioned us over into the 911 dispatch center here through the city of Kingman with uh, the NACFD and the Golden Valley Fire District, and as well as we've made some uh, changes with the base hospital, try to streamline the service and cut the costs. Um, as, we, as we project down the road, 
Uh, I don't see a great change in our staffing levels because financially we're operating at the level we really need to be operating at. Uh, call volume and population are kind of the, the two things we've looked at. And as we move forward, we, we see that staffing level staying about the same. Uh, any questions on the operational side? Any questions? Okay, thank you guys. All right, I think that was, I think that was it, and I'm happy to, and Chief Moore, ha we're happy to stand for any questions that the board might have. Okay. I don't have any questions, but I would like to say thank you for such a stellar job in putting this back together again, <clears throat> continuing to offer service to those folks out there. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you very much. Chair, Mr. Watson, thank you. Supervisor Moss? Nothing, thank you very much. Supervisor thank Johnson? You. Is he still on? No questions, okay. thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have the National Center for State Courts Report on Design Feasibility Study for the proposed Mojave County Courthouse. Good morning, may it please the Chairman, Honorable Board Members, Administration and Council. In a moment, I will turn the podium over to our court administrator, Kip Anderson, who will present a slideshow establishing some of the poignant reasons for a new courthouse. He will then also introduce our guests from the National Center for State Courts. The uh, National Center for State Courts was retained by the court as a result of uh, obtaining a grant from the State Justice Institute to not only generate the report, but also a design concept for the court. And that uh, report and the design concept was included within the board packet. As the board is aware, 15 years ago when it passed the quarter cent sales tax, the number one reason and priority for that sales tax was a new courthouse. Here we are 15 years later and that priority remains. In addition, I think that if you ask administration, what is the one existing county building that based upon lack of functionality and obsolescence that needs to be replaced, it would be the Mojave County Courthouse. So with those opening remarks, I'll turn the microphone and the podium over to Mr. Anderson to uh, go through the slideshow. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Angus and uh, members of the board. Thank you for this opportunity. We, uh, we'll, we'll try to keep it moving, Chairman. Um, we did want to just show you a few slides, um, not to turn anybody's stomach this morning uh, after the positive things, but we wanted to show you a few slides of our, of our Mojave County Courthouse. It's a beautiful building. Uh, there's a few of us that have wonderful offices, but there's quite a few that work in some tough uh, positions. So just a few pictures here. These are some pictures, um, and I think our clerk of the court is in the audience today too, Verlin. These are some uh, pictures of her windows looking into her office area. You can see that not a lot of light gets through those windows. We're, we're actually working with Public Works to hopefully make some changes there in the coming year, but uh, the courthouse has a lot of things that need to be improved. Here, here's a, a picture of uh, one of our courtroom clerk offices. Um, did we lose it? Can you see it on your monitors? Well, it's, it's up on mine, there we go. Um, you can see that we've pushed, we've put people into what used to be closets, uh, any type of available space, we're making uh, use of it. Uh, here's uh, the main hallway in the clerk's area. Uh, you can see it's very narrow, we have to use it for uh, putting up our copy machines. You can see that there's pipes and things running above them. Um, and it's one of their main work areas. Here's in their financial work areas. And obviously if you look up and you see the, the, the pipes, uh, water pipes, sewer pipes, um, and we've jammed in several, uh, I shouldn't say jammed in, we've, put, we've uh, strategically placed many of uh, several employees into these work areas. Um, um, and, and over the years, we've tried to do the best we can to improve them. And I know Verlin um, uh, is concerned about this. We're concerned about it. We've, uh, we've, we've met with Public Works. We've done the best we can. But again, a lot of wires, a lot of uh, heating and air ducting up there, trying to make it the best that we can in, in what we have. I, again, just some additional pictures there. I, I don't want to belabor the point, but another, another closet area that's been converted into a workstation. Um, you can get a close look at uh, 
Uh, if the toilet's flushed too long, it gets a little noisy at that workstation. Um, uh, I don't know if Judge Gertler wanted to make a point about this. This is an area that through that wood, well, Judge, you want to, I know you wanted to say something. Else. This is one of our main uh, security concerns. Uh, you can see the plywood over the hole into the courthouse. We had a homeless individual that had climbed the fence near the air conditioning units and had obtained access to the courthouse and was living in the courthouse. Uh, the court employees referred to the individual as Mike. Uh, we found some of his personal... Uh, not Mr. Hendricks. Though. Not Mr. <laughs> Hendricks, though. Just generically referred to this indi homeless individual as Mike. And uh, we found some of his personal effects uh, in the courthouse. Um, and that was the reason for the uh, plywood board over the hole into the court. All right, let me just finish up, but just a couple of other shots. I did want to just show you a couple of our courtrooms as well. As you know, these courtrooms were converted. This used to be the county building, so there were county offices in there. We've got support pillars that are um, obstructing the view in some of our courtrooms, which is, you know, just not a good way to conduct justice. I, Supervisor Moss, I don't know if you, you've, I'm sure you've been in a couple of these courtrooms, and. I don't know if, if they're handy to hide behind or not, probably, but it certainly makes it hard for the jurors and the judges to conduct business. This is Judge Jansen's courtroom, and as a result of a criminal jury trial that was in that courtroom, we did have a court of appeals case that the issue was the actual uh, courtroom and its operation. And the reason for the uh, issue is that counsel could not see the jurors as the jurors were reacting to questions and answers of the witnesses. And fortunately, the Court of Appeals uh, decided um, against that particular issue, because, and if it had not, we would not have been able to utilize that courtroom for jury trials. And then just to finish up, um, this is one of the restrooms in the jury, off of one of our jury rooms, very, very, very small. Um, and then quick this slide, uh, unfortunately sometimes this is the way we can have to bring in some of the in custodies. We've been working with the sheriff to try to streamline that, but again, not, not a very uh, secure setup. And then this is uh, Judge Weiss's courtroom up on the third floor. Again, another pillar, or, or no, that's the same shot of Judge Jansen, sorry. And then uh, we've got some of these unfortunate steps coming out of restrooms and some things that aren't set up very well. So. Um, so just to, those are just a few of the, of the concerns. Um, we, uh, we hope that uh, with the National Center presentation and some of the information, I, I, and I know you've had an opportunity to look at it, but I want to introduce uh, Chang Ming and Nathan Hall from the National Center. They've, uh, Chang Ming worked on our 2006-2007 study as well. Um, I want to turn it over to them and let them share a few thoughts on their presentation, some of the material they put together. Thank you for your time. Good morning, Chairman and the member of the board. My name is Chen Mingye. I'm very, very happy to be here again. As uh, Kip just mentioned, I was here in 2006 and 2007 doing the study. And uh, so this is the time uh, we did something different than the last time. So we just want to briefly highlight the, the changes and the recommendation as this round of feasibility study. And, uh, First of all, I, I guess everybody loved the old building and uh, historic courthouse from outside, looks marvelous. And, but once you get in, you find out there's some, some very, very strange, uh, ironic, awkward situation, as Kip just highlights some of this uh, interior difficulty we have. And uh, as a planner, uh, we look at this uh, issue, and he pretty much highlights most of the typical old court building phase that means functionality, inadequate of space, and also security. And all of those issues are facing us today. And that's what National Center has been charged to look at the feasibility to make a new uh, courthouse structure and with certain uh, restriction on the size and the cost for doing that, see whether we can develop some concept that can fit in some given budget, okay? For, for the construction. And so this time it's a little bit different and not just the scope, but also the cost. We want to make sure that uh, with a given cost target, uh, we can meet the basic requirement of the court. Okay. 
Okay. And so this is the objective uh, that we're trying to address in this project. As you can see that, and uh, this concept is to address some of the uh, occupant, courthouse occupant, which is a little bit shrunk from the last time. This is to address the, the courtroom issue, functionality, and we want to address the, uh, what's the modern courthouse and what's the modern courtroom should be. What's a typical nice safety issue need to be addressed in the new building? And with that, we develop a fairly sophisticated uh, space program which identify all the functional area required based on the proposed occupancy. In, in summary, generally this building try to accommodate the following uh, uh, space, major space. We plan to have seven superior court quorum, okay? And with uh, additional chamber, a chamber, because understanding there are judges coming from the satellite facility into Kingman, so we provide some additional office space for them while they come to work in the court. And also we try to address the issue of the two uh, JP court in Kingman area. And so we identify the occupancy, the number of people working in those uh, courts and the offices. And we also uh, look at the future requirement for the growth for the clerical court and identify what's the space. Uh, and uh, a summary, if we are going to build the building today, okay, with seven superior quorum in the three-story structure, the square footage estimate is almost like 74,000 square feet. If we add two additional JP core and the clerks of the JP core office, we are looking at a total square footage close to 89,000 square feet. Yeah. With that, and some of the space issue in the concept we are going to introduce to you later, uh, pretty much address most of modern courthouse design requirement, which correct some of the issue and problem that Kip just showed you in the picture. Okay, we want the functionality issue. We want to address the efficiency of how the operation should be when you locate the proper space next to each other and connect them with proper circulation. And then we want to address the security requirement. We said, uh, this is some of the general concept we used in the development of the, of the new building uh, stacking and di uh, diagram. In general, you can see that the building uh, floor plan, this is a typical courtroom plan with the blue area highlighted as interface area where the public and the court and judicial officer meet. And that's where the courtroom is located. Uh, above that, there's a green area. This is a public area, not the, for public circulation, but also we are going to provide attorney-client conference space so attorney can talk to their client in private rather than doing in public. That's one of the major areas we try to address individuals' privacy and the matter, uh, confidential matter, matter they litigate. The third one would be the lower area, you see the pink area, we identify as the employee area. And that's where judge chamber supports that. Uh, they will work and they will move, move about in those areas. That's a typical concept which is quite different than what you have today. And uh, after this, I want uh, our staff architect, Nathan Hall, to introduce you how we analyze the site situation and how do we place the structure. Thank you and good morning. Uh, just a little brief uh, summary of what we have done um, and what our assumptions are on this project was to utilize the same site that was uh, indicated in the 2007 master plan. The proposed site is to the west, northwest of the existing county administration building here. Um, and it would be um, a concept that could accommodate, we feel, about 150 to 200 public parking spaces and an additional 40 or 50 uh, secure staff and judges parking spaces. Um, those, those numbers assume that that annex building um, would go away. Developing the adjacency, we had to consider both the square footage 
uh, requirements that we developed, as Cheng Ming explained, we also had to consider what site options we have available. We also considered some of the uh, precedents and, and trends in modern courthouse design uh, and planning. So we developed this sort of L-shaped concept, and it's this, not a uh, detailed design, it's more of a space allocation concept, but it, uh, it uh, tries to capture some of these um, zoning and adjacency concepts. We have a main entry facing Beale Street um, where uh, people would enter uh, through a um, secure screening area. At that point um, on the bottom right you can see is where uh, a, a JP court public service interface would happen. On the bottom left uh, you would see uh, the clerk of the court uh, up on the top left in the tan portion, uh, we've included a jury assembly. Um, and then you can see in this blocking and, and, and stacking area, we have in the back of the house some of that red area, which is where we would have a sally port and secure in custody accommodations. Um, and, and you can see the secure uh, circulation areas on the back of the house in the uh, kind of grayish blue color. On the second floors is where we begin some of the courthouse and uh, adjudication spaces. Uh, as you can see, what we have is the central, two bigger, larger courtrooms in the central part of the courthouse, and those are serviced by the secure um, elevator for in-custody travel, um, directly adjacent to the courtrooms, court floor holding accommodations on the upper, um, top, I guess, northern portion, we have three uh, non-criminal uh, hearing rooms and, and civil trial courtrooms. And then on the uh, bottom right, we have the two justice of the peace courtrooms. If you'll notice, these are all connected via a restricted circulation corridor. Uh, on the bottom left, we have facilities for judges' chambers and jury deliberation that are um, accessed via secure point to the public hallway. Uh, but yet share a secure common corridor. And then on the third floor, just briefly, we have two more criminal uh, equipped courtrooms. We have space for um, mediation, court administration, court services. We also see uh, a dashed area on the bottom right, which shows the potential for two additional courtrooms uh, that could be built if they were planned uh, correctly on a flat roof for additional growth. And I want to explain what the potentials are on this next slide because we do know that we're facing a budget limit of what might be feasible for the county to entertain. At the same time, we know that the court adds approximately five, uh, one judge every five to six years. So on this uh, blocking massing concept, you can see Beale Street, you can see the sheriff office, you can see the existing parking lot. On, on diagram number one, that shows the superior court only concept. Diagram two shows a concept with a superior court and a, the two justice of the peace courts and related support space. And then on, on the diagram labeled number three, we show uh, in that blue sort of color the future expansion potential. And that includes um, another set of courtrooms above the justice of the peace courts that could potentially be planned for two stories. We have a potential for expansion above the criminal equipped courtrooms uh, on the middle section of the building. And then we have uh, diagrammed the potential for expansion on the northern uh, part of the building to expand clerk offices and the civil and hearing rooms on that section of the building. And these are not final design concepts, but from a functional adjacency and blocking uh, and site utilization scheme, we think it's important that the county keep in mind the future potential, even in the reality of building a smaller building today. This just briefly summarizes um, our opinion of cost. If the superior court were built, uh, only the superior court, it's in the range of 18 and a half to 21 million, we believe. 
um, the Superior Court, uh, and the additional Justice of the Peace Courts, uh, likely cost range of 22 to 25 million. I guess the concept, uh, to, in, to cap the concept, uh, you look at the price range, you look at the site, and also look at the most critical part of that is the gross provision. This concept show, uh, with the addition uh, on the top of the JP course uh, portion, and also with the addition to the, uh, to the site, toward Beale Street, and we see a 100% growth capacity building in this concept. And today we have seven quorum, which means 100%. That means 14 superior court quorum plus a two JP court quorum. That's the concept we have. And uh, we look at this type of uh, structure with a three-story main structure with a two-story addition for the JP court. And this type of construction probably uh, construction period probably two to three years time. Okay. 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 Any questions or I, I would I, I would make a comment with the um, indulgence of the chairman. Uh, based upon my personal experience, the courthouse, the new courthouse, is desperately needed. Um, I don't. I don't hide behind the pillar. The pillar blocks me, <laughs> so, and it's very difficult for an attorney to do his job when he can't see the judge or the jury half the time. But it's and that gets beyond just the um, safety and health and what I think is some fire hazards existing in the court, court current courthouse. So thank you for your presentation. Uh, my apologies on that miss uh, comment there, Supervisor. <laughs> uh, I, and uh, I would just add that, you know, we did, as we were going through this process, we did meet with uh, uh, County Administrator Hendricks and John Timko as well and tried to keep them informed on what we were doing and uh, we appreciated their support and we certainly appreciate the support of the board. And just one a note, a reminder, next Monday, if you'd like, if you can, please come to our dedication in Lake Havasu as well. We, Look, look forward to that event. Thank you. And Kim, I took it for the humor it was intended. There's been many times I've wanted to hide behind that pillar. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I know the history of this goes back a long way, and I'll have to come up to par with it. You know, you say that it was the top priority, but all these other buildings got built, and you're still here <laughs> giving this presentation. So uh, there's a lot of things uh, I, I need to get up to speed on. Uh, and uh, just because we talk about abandoned buildings, what would happen to the existing courthouse? Um, um, that's that's a very good question. I uh, you know I don't I think that one thought or one time there was a thought that maybe the city would uh, like to move their facility in there, but I, I don't know how feasible that would be for them, and then what kind of financial arrangements they'd make with the county, but. But that's a good point. It is a historical building. Um, it's coming up on its 100 years. It started operation in uh, 1915. So uh, it, yeah, you can't tear it down. And I'm not sure you could auction it off either. So good, good question, Super. And, and everything's been looked into about, there's just no way you can uh, rehab that building. Well, again, being it historical, uh, it'd be very difficult to do any kind of, to do too much in interior and then the, the the size is just isn't there, and then to be able to make the security and the circulation patterns that we need, uh, it, I, it, it would be very difficult. So, so where are we on this whole process? I mean, just presentation, and, and what about funding? Madam Chairman, if it uh, pleases the board, I could ask uh, John Timko, our financial director, to come down here and, and discuss funding. I mean, are we at that place now that we're talking about today, or is that, was this just a presentation for this? I mean, I don't wanna. He could explain, uh, Mr. Timko, uh, Madam Chairman, could explain that uh, uh, about how long we're gonna be continuing to collect the quarter cent sales tax and the sunset clause. He can also yeah, uh, tell expected revenues that we're gonna be receiving from that. Um, there's been some uh, discussion on, on alternate uh, revenues with our current financial conditions it doesn't look like we're going to be underspending our general fund revenues and and at least this year and be able to contribute to the building fund but if we may and and please the board i'd like for john timco to address that 
<clears throat> yeah, just if you can quickly just give a real sure. little bit of the history of, of the Madam Chairman and members of the board, the, uh, the quarter cent sales tax uh, has been a primary engine for funding the capital expansion uh, in the county over the past 10, 10 years. Uh, it expires at the end of calendar uh, 2019. And at this point, it's generating five to six million dollars a year in revenue. Those revenues have been um, uh, utilized to build this building that we're in and to, uh, to cooperate in financing the, uh, the, the new jail facility. Uh, at current, the jail facility is consuming 100% uh, of the revenues generated by the, uh, the sales tax fund. They are actually a couple million dollars lower per year now than they were when we financed the jail uh, due to the economy. Looking forward uh, with those funds uh, sunsetting, it's very difficult to do a financing with a revenue stream that would only have approximately three years of run room uh, to do a 20-year financing. And so uh, at this point, the, the concept is that we could fund this uh, approximately the end of fiscal 19, we would have a, be able to accumulate enough money for the lower end uh, cost projections, the 18 to 21 million uh, could be generated in that time frame. There are other options available. Uh, the, quite frankly, the easiest and probably the most beneficial long run to the county would be to extend the quarter cent sales tax uh, or simply to remove the sunset uh, of the quarter cent sales tax so that we would have an ongoing uh, building and building maintenance fund to support the infrastructure of the county. Uh, if that were done, we could finance the building uh, pretty quickly and uh, get started probably within, uh, within a year. Uh, other things that have been suggested and we're starting to explore would be a public-private partnership um, where a, uh, a third party would come in and either assist or fully fund the construction and, in essence, work, work in a lease basis with us until we repaid their, uh, their investment. Uh, again, the repayment is the, uh, is the critical part there, and without a dedicated source of funds, that's going to be presenting some problems as well. So the, uh, the, best, uh, the best that I could recommend as far as going forward uh, to begin as soon as possible on this construction would be simply removing the sunset of the quarter cent sales tax, which would allow that as a uh, source of funding into the future, which we could utilize to help us finance this project. I want to ask something. <clears throat> when you put in the quarter cent sales tax, you knew this day would come, that it would sunset. What, when you put it in, what was the plan? You know, people say once government puts in a, a, a tax, no matter what they say, it never goes away. And I'm one of the people who say that. So I just want to hear the thinking behind when this started. Did you really believe that it was going to be sunsetted, or, or did you believe that you'd be standing here one day? I mean, did something dramatically change? Madam Chairman, if I could, I, I was not uh, employed by the county at the time that that tax was, was passed, and I think probably Mike and uh, Bill and Supervisor Johnson were probably the only three that remain that were actively involved in that. However, I do know that it was based on a very comprehensive study of all the uh, buildings in the county. Uh, we, we looked at uh, space needs, growth needs. At that time, there was quite a bit of discussion about having all the county uh, relocate someplace into Golden Valley. And, um, and so they prioritized the buildings. Um, need overcame uh, those, those priorities. And uh, I think they, in fact, did think that, that that would be sufficient to build all the buildings that were in their plan um, and so that it would be able to sunset and the fact that um, you know building inflation uh, ate up all the funds before we got to the end of the list uh, is probably the, where we're sitting today. Okay, if we decide not to sunset it, tell me again how this would go down. Uh, Madam Chairman, I'd like to add a little bit about what John had said. One of the things that, and the judge might also, one of the things that wasn't contemplated in that original list was a jail. So we had a, a $70 million plus investment that we had to fund uh, and that actually uh, caused us to modify the plans and not be able to build a court facility but uh, what the judge had originally mentioned when the original list was made up I believe uh, what was contemplated and, I, and I, I'll probably miss one but uh, 
the courthouse, a comprehensive $45 million courthouse was number one on the list. Uh, the sheriff's office was uh, contemplated, this administrative building was contemplated, um, planning and zoning and development services was contem and public works was contemplated, but and nowhere in that original uh, proposal for the quarter cent sales tax was a jail contemplated. Chairman Angus, uh, the board's res resolution number 99-148 which was recorded with the official records of Mojave County on August 24 of 1999, set forth the priority of projects and the estimated cost. The number one project was a Law and Justice Center at $34,250,000. As you can see from the presentation, we've reduced down the scope and looking at approximately 18 to 20 million. The next item was a general government building at 15 million then a health and human services center for five million, then a public works planning and zoning building for 4,250,000, and then sheriff substations at 2,500. So okay. uh, County Administrator Hendricks was correct, the jail was not included within that, right. within the five And priorities. I just want the public to know that that was mandated, that we do that jail, right? And that was, we had no choice, and that, that's why we're here. That's why you got bumped out. I still don't quite understand why you got bumped out and we, we have two development services and planning and zoning that came up before you guys, but we'll talk about that another right. time. Madam Chairman, I have a brief question, if I may. Um, I'm trying to understand some of the numbers here, uh, Mr. Timiko, if I could. If I understand correctly, after we pay off the jail, and that's in 2016, is that correct? So it'll be early 2017. 2017 and after we pay off the jail you're anticipating roughly 15 to 18 million dollars of revenue generated by the sales tax before it sunsets that's correct sir okay so if we wanted to do the low end um, assuming the worst case scenario with the sales tax so we have us 15 million bucks which means we'll have to come up with another 3 million for the low end and if we go to the high end we'll have to come up with another 10 million five to six yeah. okay I, th I thought it was $25 million for oh, option number three. You're, you're correct. With the, with the justice course, that would be that, yes. Okay, yes. So, and knowing that every five to six years we add a superior court judge and Mojave County population is still growing, I suspect that trend will continue. So if we went with the low end, just around the time we're starting construction, we'll have to add another judge. <laughs> so. that, that's correct, sir. Okay, Supervisor Johnson, do you have any questions? No, but I have a lot of statements to correct some of the erroneous statements that have been made, but I don't think this is the appropriate time to do it. I think if we're going to look at new buildings, then it should be in a capital improvement plan uh, that should be brought to the board so all buildings that need to be replaced should be addressed at one time and put into a budget. I, I would like to state I really I fully support and I'm um, very proud of the presentation that was given or honored by the presentation that was given by the courts and by the um, the National Center for State Courts. This is a public need. It's something that needs to be done, and I don't think it's a problem that we should go and try to do it on the cheap because all we're doing is leaving another problem for our predecessors, our successors, five, six, seven years down the road. I think it's a problem we should try to solve for the long term. However, we managed to get it solved. Okay. Any other comments, statements, questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. It's time for the consent agenda. Number five, the consent agenda items five through thirty-nine will be considered. We have thirty-nine, right? Will be considered as a group and acted upon by one motion minus any items pulled for discussion. Any items? I'd like to pull item 23 um, as I have a potential conflict. Okay. I have none. Supervisor Johnson? Done. Okay. Motion? I move to approve the consent agenda items five through 39 except for item 23. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
Motion carried. Okay, item 23, approve a multiple award of contract number 14-B-02, hot mix and cold mix to McCormick Construction Company, Bullet City, Arizona, Campbell Ready Mix, Lake Havasu City, Arizona, and Desert Construction, Kingman, Arizona, on an annual as needed basis, with the sole option of the county to renew the contracts up to four additional one-year periods on behalf of the Public Works Department. Supervisor Moss. Um, I have to abstain from discussion on this particular item, Madam Chair. Okay. Okay, I'll make a motion to approve item number 23. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carried. And Peggy, I didn't vote. <laughs> and, and you abstained. I abstained. Okay. Off to the regular agenda, number 40. Discussion and possible action. Approve transferring the fiscal year 2014 user fee revenues in the amount of $35,520 and unallowable salary, benefits, and travel expenses in the amount of $55,876.75 from the recorder's surcharge, surcharge fund, which is, is 20112800, to the general fund, recorder's organization, uh, 1001280 and authorize a transfer of $100,746.52 from the general fund contingency to process a general fund transfer to the recorder's surcharge fund to cover unallowable expense in fiscal year 2013. And this was continued from our meeting of April 7th. Okay. Um. Motion for discussion, Madam Chair. Okay, um, I, we don't need, do we need a motion to discuss this? No. Oh, no. Okay, Carol Meyer, she's our recorder. I know she wants to speak with this, to, to this. Chairwoman, supervisors, oh, I'm not that tall. Um, for the record, I think it is important that the facts concerning agenda item number 40 be explained to you. The legislature passed ARS 11-475 many years ago. The statute created the recorder's surcharge fund, which was divided, which was designed to provide a funding source addressing the high cost of the county recorder's software system. In Mojave County, the funding source is a one-time $4 charge paid upon the certain recordations. The statute is very specific as to what the monies can be spent for. The statute states, and I quote, monies in this fund may only be used for purchasing hardware, software, training employees to operate the system, maintaining the system, purchasing equipment, maintenance agreements, and updating the system hardware or software for the county recorder's office. Monies shall not be for expenses other than for the support of the county recorder's automated system. If in consistency with this section, the general fund shall reimburse the document storage, retrieval, conversion, and maintenance fund for all improper and inconsistent expenditures. The last sentence in the statute is why we are here today. The Auditor General is charged with auditing the fund and directing the Mojave County Board of Supervisors to replenish the fund and make it whole for improper expenditures. This last February, the Auditor General completed an audit of the expenditures from our fund and published a report identifying inappropriate expenditures for salaries and travel. Since 2009, I'm, since 2009 I made the county aware that this was a big concern of mine and through attrition did not hire vacated positions to ensure that we could move towards rectifying this situation. Each year I have asked to have personnel funded outside of this fund, but continually my pleas were rejected. It is unfortunate that it took an audit to bring to light this problem and validate my concerns. The painful result is that the board will now have to dip into the general fund to make the recorder's fund whole. Item 40, um, oh, excuse me. I give notice that this may not be over yet. The Auditor General wants to reach back and identify past year's inappropriate expenditures 
and, the board, and for the board to make the fund whole for each year. Item 40 only addresses 2013. We charge a small, um, let's see. Okay, I would also like to take the opportunity to seek your support concerning the distribution of the recorder's fees to replenish fund expenditures. We charge a small fee to commercial users for access to our online system as well as to companies that receive an FTP site upload on a weekly basis. After an analysis by OMB, these fees were revised in 2011 and in 2012, which the board approved. By statute, we cannot make a profit but can recoup some of the costs to operate. In the past, this money has always been returned to the surcharge fund to help offset the enormous cost of the system. As, revenue fees, uh, as revenues from funds to help offset this enormous cost for the system, as revenue from fees have decreased, I took it upon myself to promote the system and have significantly increased our revenues from fees in order to offset the cost of maintaining equipment and purchasing equipment uh, that the $4 portion of the recording fee has not been able to cover. I do not support the recent change whereby these fees are now directed to the general fund and not to the recorder's fund. These fees are being generated to offset the cost to maintain the recorder system and should not go to the general fund. I have been threatened that I will suffer more recorder personnel reductions than, I, than the seven I have already lost if I do not nod to the diversion of these loss in the funds. I request the board direct these funds to be left in the surcharge account for their intended purpose and that my staffing levels not be threatened because I am trying to do the right thing. Thank you. Questions? Yes. May I, may I? Yeah, go ahead. Um, for the edification of the public who may be um, listening um, to this, um, uh, Carol, uh, can you define or give us a, a, a layman's definition of what the user fees, uh, the user fee is used for? I think it was mentioned during the speech or to the presentation, mm -hmm. but I want to clarify both these two fees. Okay, the user fees that we are collecting is for the website and for the uh, FTP site. These, all the expenses come out of the surcharge. That is the um, leases on the computers, that is the maintenance on the computers, and that is the recorder's system. And that's the user fee? That's. Mm, what about the surcharge fund? The surcharge, well that is what. There's one, is the one and the same? Yes. Okay. So um, what are those to be used for? Is just to maintain your automated computer system? Right, well the recorder system alone is over, um, it depends, it's 70 to 80,000, it goes up 5% a year. And that's for the system itself. Uh, then we've got the leases on the computers and we've got the maintenance on the computers and any of the additional, um, uh, equipment that we have there. We have um, a lot of uh, different equipment. We have a lab and everything, so. Okay, thank you, Carol, I appreciate that. Okay, um, could John Timko come up and, and tell that side of it? it? It seems to me, I mean, if this is something that is set by statute, it's black and white, and I, I'm still not clear as to what that is. Madam Chairman, members of the board, I just uh, preface my remarks by saying that um, I've been with the county since 2002. This fund predated my arrival. And in the entire time that I've been here, uh, employees and travel have been paid from that fund. We've been audited each of those years and no audit exceptions until this year have ever been mentioned. I agree with, uh, with the recorder that she has requested that we uh, transition people out of that fund uh, that she thought were inappropriately charged. And we had in fact been doing that. We're down to one where uh, when I started, I think we had four. Given dif <clears throat> excuse me, difficulties in the general fund budget in the past few years, we have not been able to fully trans uh, transfer all the people off that fund. But in last year's budget, we did move everybody except the final employee who was planned to have been moved this year. As, as regards the fees that, uh, that are at issue, the 
statute very clearly states that this fund is created and consists of monies received pursuant to subsection C. Subsection C is the $4 special recording surcharge fee. Uh, I would point out that prior recorders had taken the interpretation as to the use of the fees uh, where it included the phrase maintenance of the system to include people who are required to maintain the system by inputting documents into the system and uh, doing those kind of activities. And so uh, while we had a, uh, a liberal interpretation which was agreed to by prior auditors, the Auditor General takes a more uh, narrow uh, approach to what system maintenance is. And so uh, we have negotiated with them that we will refund from the general fund to the recorder's fee fund this hundred and some thousand net of, uh, of extraneous revenues and uh, unallowed costs. That's the $100,000 transfer. And uh, we have uh, so far this year encountered additional expenses which we will uh, transfer from the general fund back into the recorder's fee fund. So uh, the, um, the issue here is one of a misinterpretation from prior recorders predating me saying that it was okay to charge employees uh, and travel there. Um, to a new interpretation of the auditors, which said it's not, and we're rectifying that and making it whole. Okay, so um, Carol Meyer, so you're against this, so you want the fee to stay in the recorder's office? I, I'm just, it seems to me, do we need a legal opinion on this? Because if you're saying that's Madam, the interpretation, you're saying that's the interpretation. Madam Chairman, if I might, there's two different fees at issue here. We have no problem leaving the $4 recorder's fee going into this fund as it is required by the statute. Okay. The statute, though, says that the fund consists of monies pursuant to Section C, which is only this $4 fee. The additional monies, and I congratulate the recorder for generating additional revenues, uh, that she's generating through selling these services uh, to various individuals. Uh, is essentially uh, a general fund activity and is not subject to the restrictions that are placed on the funds that go into this fee fund. And so our recommendation along with the Auditor General's is that we're not putting the expenses in uh, into the fund uh, with a very narrow uh, interpretation of what maintenance is. We shouldn't be putting extra funds in there that are uh, subject to these restrictions when they're being generated by general fund funded activity. Is there something you want to say? Uh, the general fund does not pay for any of the expenses that is occurred with um, uh, this, the website and the FTP site. Um, if anything, it would be one or two percent of employees' salaries, but it would be very minor because everything we have automated. We even have a billing uh, quarterly that is automated. Um, it goes through email. Um, the FTP site uh, is uploaded, and those that pay for the service push a button and it's downloaded. They download it from home or wherever they are. But, uh, th you know, this fund, I think, should stay where the expenses are being taken out of. But Is this something we just need a legal opinion on? Madam Chairman, I've discussed this with Mr. Timko, and and do concur with his conclusion that a, a strict reading of the language uh, would allow the, the money to be transferred to the general fund. Obviously, if the board wanted to, to recommend that it not be not happen that way and be put into the recorder's account, you could do that. Madam Chair, um, as I understand it, there's one source of fees which are required to remain with the recorder. And there's another source of fees which the recorder has used her initiative and her, her desire to improve the operations of her office to generate um, via off services she provides to the public, and that's a discretionary transfer. And it occurs to me that if we go to our elected officials and we sweep funds that they used um, to do a, a novel or a new approach in order to improve the efficiencies of their office, what we're going to be doing is deterring any sort of initiative. Why would they bother is what it would come down to. And it is my view um, that we should table this issue for the next meeting and direct 
the county administrator to come back with a new proposal um, which does not result in any funds being transferred or moved out of the recorder's office. I would try to interpret this and move numbers in and out and do a motion right now, but the odds are high I would mess it up. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I, I think we, I want to table this <clears throat> as well. Madam Chairman, um, I, I think that's, a, that's a, a perfect solution to this. I would like to add one thing. Um, you know, it appears that uh, logically this fund is like a, uh, a building fund or a uh, uh, planning and zoning permit fund, and those funds get remitted to the general fund and then they're reallocated during the budget process. So I believe, uh, you know, to say that an elected official can keep a fund that's not statutorily under their complete authority. I think that fund should be under the board's authority during the budget process and should be reallocated accordingly. That's, that's off the cuff. Thank you. And if I could, um, uh, in, uh, before I make my motion, I just want to say what I think, what I was trying to say a little earlier, it's very poor public policy for a board of supervisors to create the um, example that elected officials who use the power and authority and initiative of their office to generate revenues don't get the benefit of that because we'll never see it again. It's like saying, I'm, oh great, you've earned a profit, we're taking it. <laughs> I mean, why would you bother even trying to earn a profit? Um, so I, I really do believe, whether it's under our authority or not, um, when it comes to this, the remainder, because we're talking this current budget year that this motion is fixing. Am I understanding that correctly? Mike? Yes, sir, that's correct. So when it comes to the next budget year, we can discuss it when we get into those discussions. It would be my preference that those monies be left with the recorder as part of our discretionary authority. But in dealing with this per issue, number 40, I would like to make a motion that we um, table item 40 to our next meeting, that it come back to us, craft in such a format that the transfer from the general fund into the recorder's office to um, take into account some improper um, expenditures be corrected, but that no monies be removed from the funds generated by the recorder's office and put together a proper motion in that format for the next meeting. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second the motion for table. Okay, I got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Discussion, Madam Chair. Okay. The uh, discussion I would have is that be my request to give them 30 days back at, at two weeks, pretty, pretty quick turnaround for everybody to get their okay. information together. If Ms. Meyer is okay with it, I have no problem amending my motion for a 30-day period. Very good. Second amended. Okay, we've got a motion amended and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, number 41 has been pulled. On to 42, discussion and possible action. Acknowledge, acknowledge receipt and set for public hearing on May 5th, 2014 to consider a bingo license. Application for Golden Shores Civic Association 13136 Golden Shores Parkway, Golden Shores, Arizona to be held on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Madam Chair, I move that we approve item 42. <laughs> I'll second the motion. Okay, motion second, all in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye. opposed? On to number 43, discussion and possible action, direct staff to hold a new public auction to sell real property known as Arnold Plaza, located at 301 and 303 Oak Street, Kingman, Arizona, further identified as APN 303-08-151 and-153 in accordance with ARS 11-251. Madam Chair, I move that we approve item 43 of the agenda. Second the motion. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you. All right. Next up, um, I have, that was the item I put on, but I am pulling that item. So if there's no other things to discuss, anything else, then I believe we are adjourned. Thank you.